Welcome to No Longer Conformed. I'm Eric Garthy, and we are considering an allegiance to God's Word by studying Genesis chapters 1 through 11. In this session, we'll be looking at Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, the dispersion of the people. And again, we'll be looking at the, the whole text as we consider Genesis chapter 1 through 11. We need to have a spiritual standard, and we do. The Word of God. We don't have the right to set our own behavior rules that contradict what is revealed in the Bible. Truth by consensus is not God's way. Well, the world had to be repopulated after the flood. Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 and 19. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And there was a bit of uh, post-flood drama that is in the text, so we need to read it. Beginning with verse 20. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. And then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine, and he knew what his young, younger son had done to him. And then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Let's, let's continue to see the repopulation of Noah's three sons in Genesis chapter 10. Now, this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The, and the sons were, and sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togarma. The sons of Javan were Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanin. From these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rama, and Sabtesha. And the sons of Rama were Sheba and Dadan. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. From that land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala, that is the principal city. Misraim begot Ludim, Anamin, Lahabim, Naphtuhim, Pathrusim, and Kasluhim, from whom 
became the Philistines and the Kafortem, Torim. Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, the Jebusite, the Amorite, and the Girgashite, the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, the Ardvadite, the Zemurite, and the Hamathite. Afterwards, the families of the Canaanites were dispersed, and the borders of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as you go toward Gerar, as far as Gaza. Then you go toward Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim, as far as Lasha. These were the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages and the lands, and in their nations. And children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. The sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz, Hull, Gether, and Mash. Arphaxad begot Salah, and Salah begot Eber, and Eber had two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan begot Almodad, Shelef, Hazah, Maveth, Jera, Hadorim, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimael, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. All of these were the sons of Joktan. And their dwelling place was from Misha, as you go toward Sipha, the mountain of the east. These were the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their nations. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, in their nations, and from these, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. In the repopulation, people were divided as nation groups. Genesis chapter 10, verses 2 through 5, the sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiraz. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Rephath, and Togermah. The sons of Javan were Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. Genesis chapter 10, verses, verse 6 and verse 20. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. And verse 20. These were the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, and in their nations. Then Genesis chapter 10, verse 22, and then verses 31, 32. The sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. These were the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages and their lands, according to their nations. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, in their nations, and from these nations were divided on the earth after the flood. Then we see the situation that's recorded at Babel in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. And this is where it becomes critical. We're just passing a lot of information on of the genealogy, and now we're focusing in on something very important. Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city 
and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. What happened? A story of the Tower at Babel. Maybe you haven't heard it much. Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. These people wanted to be fameless. It's all pride. Pride always promotes rebellion against authority. The Tower of Babel is man's attempt to rule his existence and God's exposing man's futility. Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 to 12. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one of the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, and Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala, that is, the principal city. Nimrod is the main character in the event at Babel. He had the ambition of being a world ruler. You know what? Like so many others in world's history. Let's take a moment and let's consider Nimrod in this whole drama, this whole situation at this point, the repopulation after the flood. First, <clears throat> he was a great hunter, verse 9, was a mighty hunter, but he used his skill to hunt in an interesting way. He used his skill to hunt the souls of men. Revela Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5 reads, And on her forehead the name was written, Mystery, Babylon, the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Nimrod set up idolatry among all the peoples. Roman, Romans Chapter 1, verse 18, down to verse 25. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God <coughs> is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made <clears throat> like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So he first he was a great hunter and he used that skill to hunt men and their souls. Second, he was a great ruler. Verse 10, 
The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And he was, listen, he was so effective that God took note of his ambition. Third, he was a great builder. Verse 11, he went to Assyria and built Nineveh. Nimrod was the builder of the city of Nineveh. Why did this man build cities? Well, same reason anybody else would, so that he could rule them. Ambition, the desire for more and more. Discontented, seeking the honor of ruling what he builds. Essentially, he was a rebel. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Nimrod used his influence to get the entire population of earth to join him at Shinar. There was purpose in God separating the repopulation into nations, but man chose to keep together one language, one convenient place. Genesis 11, verses 1 and 2. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Listen, man has always thought and always believed that there's power in numbers. And Nimrod brought everyone together. He lured everyone into the plains of Shinar to build Babel in the tower. So man chose to keep together when God had a purpose of repopulating the world and repopulating in the form of nations. Man chose to keep together. Man chose to work together. I mean, it was quite a building plan. They made their own materials, verses three and four. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. So they chose to keep together. They chose to work together and they chose self rather than God. They concentrated on man's power, pride in their abilities. The second part of verse four, let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. God wanted them to repopulate the earth. He wanted them to spread out in nations. They chose to stay together because they didn't want to do what God told them to do in rebellion. I mean, that was blatant rebellion of what God had planned. Blatant rebellion. They couldn't get his direction because they were rebelling. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he shall direct your path. What's God's standard? Well, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it's declared all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And why? Well, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Just read Genesis chapter 11, verses five and six again. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built and the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. In his limited tolerance, God let them build for a while. Then he gave a powerful lesson in man's futility by reversing all that they did what the Lord did is evident even in the biblical construction of the record. Listen, verse one, the whole earth had one language. Verse two, they dwelt there. Verse three, 
they said to one another. Verse 4, also, excuse me, also verse 3. Come, let us make bricks. Verse 4, come, let us build ourselves. Also verse 4, a city and a tower. So they went all that way from one language to the tower. And then it says God came down in verse 5. And then watch what happens. It all goes exactly in reverse. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Come, let us confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Scatter them abroad from there, verse 8, and he confused the language of all men, verse 9. So it went in one direction, and then God came down, and he sent it all back in the opera, opera language, opposite direction. Verse 1, the whole earth had one language. By verse 9, when God had reversed everything, he confused the language of all the earth. What's the point? Well, the point is, God establishes plan, and he expects his people to obey it, even if they don't understand. It's the old hymn, Trust and Obey. He will tolerate man operating in his futile rebellion for a time. And then he exposes it. God provided the resource, resource 2 Timothy 1.3. His divine power has given, us, given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. He expects our obedience. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Listen, make God's word the final authority in your life. Because after that, it's only a matter of whether you trust and obey or not. You have a great day.